How is everyone? I wish I were. <laughs> I was telling Dean Ham. Uh, it reminded me so fondly of being in New Orleans because my car was towed earlier today. <laughs> so I want to thank the city for taking a few hours of my uh, time today to deal with uh, that issue. It reminded me of my days always parking in Frontier and accumulating about 200 tickets, which I typically would just crunch up and throw into my glove compartment until finally they tracked me down and I had to go to court. But, but fortunately, there was, there was a sympathetic judge there, so uh, I got off of all 200, so I was thankful for that. Uh, you know, it's really an honor to be here today, not only at Tulane, but uh, at this reunion event. Now, for me, although I hate to admit it, it is the 40th reunion. Now, all, many of you younger people sitting in this audience and the medical students will believe that that day will never come, but I assure you as much as you resist and don't want to believe it, it will come and you will start having lots of aches and pains. Um, 10 years ago, uh, actually, I was also honored by Tulane, uh, and I was asked to give the Thomas or um, Wallace K. Tomlinson lecture to the incoming medical students. And it was really a great honor for me because it reminded me of my own challenging path uh, to be admitted to medical school, and it reminded me of the journey that brought me uh, to medical school. And hopefully at that time, I gave um, some comments that were useful to those graduates, but I will actually refer to also some of them today. You know, one of the tenets, of course, if I can get my little arrow here working, which I'm not very good at this part of it. Uh, oh, here's my gizmo. Let's see. I have a very limited understanding of technology. So um, one of the main tenets of our profession uh, is not only the Hippocratic Oath, but the idea of first do no harm. But fundamentally, what is equally, if not more important, is compassion. Compassion not only for our patients, but compassion for ourselves. Compassion is a fundamental part of the evolution of our species, the creation of tribes, of groups of 50 to 150, which is how we survived uh, just six to 8,000 years ago. And really, it's at the core of the development of society, religion, and culture. And why is that? Because if you do not care for another, if you're not cognizant of how you behave, if you're not cognizant of the suffering of others, not only does that lead to more suffering, but actually, ultimately, believe it or not, it leads to your own unhappiness. Many would argue, though, that compassion really fundamentally is the basis of morals, ethics, and is a core part, as was pointed out, of being a physician. As physicians, we are bound by morals and ethics of our profession, which are codified in rules and define for us what is right and what is wrong. Fundamentally, ethics constrain our behavior in some ways. We know it has limits. We know what's right and wrong. But it's our values that are shaped by society, by culture, upbringing, that defines what is important to each of us and what motivates us in our actions and in regard to having respect for and uphold those ethics and our moral choices that we make. Now, some of you may wonder why a neurosurgeon is up talking about compassion. Some of you have perhaps experienced 
neurosurgeons who are not the nicest people. Have any of you experienced that? <laughs> Some people have a view that neurosurgeons are arrogant, brusque, egomaniacal, and I would suggest to you that I certainly have many of those attributes. But that being said, uh, why am I with you and why has compassion been fundamentally at the core of who I am and has guided me in my own journey? Like many of you, who you are today is a manifestation of your past. And I'll share with you a little bit about my own journey, and hopefully this will give you some insights into who I am and insights into why I feel this is very important. But not just as physicians, but it's important for us as human beings. I grew up actually in poverty. Uh, my family was on public assistance essentially the entire time I was a child uh, and was still on public assistance when I left for college. My father was an alcoholic. My mother, unfortunately, had had a stroke when I was a child, was partially paralyzed, chronically depressed, attempted suicide. Uh, sometimes we did not have enough food. We were evicted from different residences. And as you can imagine, that obviously, for a child, has a huge impact. And in fact, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this concept of ACEs, adolescent childhood experiences. And certainly, I was probably checked off every box of that. And the sad thing is that children who grow up in their, those environments rarely, if ever, escape the effects of those environments. Many will abuse drugs and alcohol. Many will have mental health issues. Many of them will die young because they're particularly susceptible to a variety of chronic disease states. So what changed for me? Why did not I follow that path? Now, some people would say that I represent sort of uh, the highest ideal of what America offers its citizens because anyone from anywhere can quote unquote succeed. But I would suggest to you that that is not truth. In society today especially, a child from my circumstances is often discarded, often has no future, often feels hopeless, filled with despair. And it's, it's horrible because I had many friends, frankly, who were probably smarter than I was, but because they did not have opportunity because they did not have access, they were discarded. What was the difference for me was that when I would have trauma going on at my house, whether emotional, physical, uh, whatever, I used to have a orange stingray bicycle. And some of you older folks remember that banana seat and uh, uh, I, uh, when that would happen or would I, when I would get particularly scared or anxious, I would get on my Stingray bicycle and ride as fast and as far away as I could. And on one of those journeys, I came to a strip mall. And I had had an interest in magic. So um, what happened was that I uh, drove by the strip mall and um, there was a magic shop, and I had an interest in magic for a long time. And in fact, I had a, uh, some of you who may have an interest in magic, I had a little plastic thumb 
I don't know if you've ever seen that. You would, you would uh, like stick something in it and then put it, you, <laughs> you would do a trick and then put it on this plastic thumb and it would seemingly disappear and I'd lost my plastic thumb, which I was, went into the magic shop to find a new plastic thumb. But anyway, I went in there and sitting at the counter was a woman in her mid-50s who greeted me and she had a radiant smile. Now, I have to tell you, when you're a 12-year-old, when you are poor, oftentimes you were judged. But in this situation, the woman treated me like I was an equal with her. She asked me questions. She was kind to me. She was interested. And what happens in that situation? You have a sense of psychological safety. And this is what we all want, to feel safe, to be heard, to have people recognize our dignity. So we began a conversation. Now, I have to tell you that one of the things that kept my attention was the fact that she was feeding me Chips Ahoy chocolate chip cookies. So it wasn't all selflessness. Uh, but after a while, um, she said to me, I really like you. I'm here for another six weeks. And if you show up, I think I could teach you something that could really help you. Now, you have to realize I was myself filled with insecurity, shame, hopelessness, despair, a feeling that I had no future. And unfortunately, in those situations, if you have that view of yourself, then you lose your dignity. Without your dignity, then you don't care what happens to you. And so by this time, I was becoming a fairly good delinquent. Um, but anyway, I said, I'll come in every day. And I did come in every day. And so what happened? The first thing that she had me do, and how many of you meditate? How many of you think that meditation is bullshit? All oh, right, there's one there. Uh, there were there actually two. Uh, well, it can be, and for many people it doesn't work. But this was, you have to remember, before meditation was talked about, I mean, this was in the late 60s. Uh, this was before we had an understanding of the actual neuroplasticity of the brain, the reality that we could change our brains. So uh, the first thing she had me do was to do a mindfulness practice. Now, you have to understand, when you come from a background like my own, you are always in a state of engagement of your sympathetic nervous system because you never know what's going to happen to you. I you didn't know if my father would come home drunk, if my mother would attempt suicide. So I was very, very stressed, even though I had lived probably my whole life like that, I really didn't even understand that. And it's like, you know, if a fish grows up in dirty water, it doesn't know it's in dirty water, right? because that's all you can relate to. But anyway, she recognized this, and she taught me a practice to, if you will, relax the body. Because if you're constantly looking around, you cannot attend. And the only way we can learn is to attend. So subsequently, uh, she taught me that technique. And I have to be honest with you, I was 12 years old. I had a lot of suspicion about what we were doing. And I didn't even understand it, but I diligently practiced that. And then once I did that, she taught me a method of also concentration. And in this instance, it was actually looking at a candle. Um, and once I had done that, I was able to relax. I was not always looking around. I could be present. Because as social beings, 
What is it that connects us? You have to be present. You have to listen. You have to be there for the other person. And this is why, unfortunately, with the corporate involvement in medicine, it takes us away from even our tasks as physicians. How many of you are typing on a computer while you're talking to a patient, uh, those physicians who are here? None of you? Not a single? Oh, there are a few. I, I mean, how can you connect with a person where they trust you, where you can create for them that sense of psychological safety? It's almost impossible. And in fact, to be frank with you, I'm probably the lowest paid neurosurgeon at Stanford. And the reason is, is because I'm a doctor first, not a neurosurgeon. And the reason I say that is, unfortunately in our system, we are compensated as surgeons for doing what? Surgery. Yet, I would suggest to you that the vast majority of patients I see do not need surgery at all. What do they need? They need somebody to truly listen to them. They need somebody to lean forward and show they're connected. They need somebody to touch them. And if you do that, actually, there are studies that indicate that the patient will have fewer complications, will lead, need less pain medication, uh, will be discharged earlier, and have a decreased readmission rate. Now, I was talking about my journey, but I diverted here to point this out to you. And this is what makes up being a physician. But back to my story. So after I had nominally mastered those techniques, because I would suggest to you, even after many years, uh, it's hard to do these things, the next thing she taught me was something that I had no conception of, and this was the negative dialogue that goes on in our heads. Uh, does anyone not have a negative dialogue going on in their heads? Okay, good. I always have one person, and I, ha I usually think they're a sociopath or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but uh, uh, it's true. And you know, there is an evolutionary exploration, or explanation for that. But needless to say, many of us, especially if you come from the type of background I came from, have this voice in your head that says, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not worthy. I don't deserve love. I'm an imposter. And essentially, it's universal. Uh, but you can change that dialogue from one of negativity to one of self-affirmation and positivity. And what happens when you do that, that shifts you from engagement of your sympathetic nervous system to engagement of your parasympathetic nervous system. And what happens when you do that is amazing things. When you're able to make that shift, the executive control areas of your brain function much, be much better. You're much more able to make, thought make thoughtful, discerning decisions versus reactive decisions. Your physiology works much better. You are benefited because when you shift to that mode, you're much, much more open, you're much more inclusive, and in fact, the reward centers in your brain actually are stimulated, so you feel better. And it has this huge effect on your peripheral physiology. What happens is that your blood pressure is lowered, your heart rate variability, which is a manifestation of which mode you're in. Those who have a decreased heart rate variability, which is associated with engagement of your sympathetic nervous system, is associated with a high level of sudden cardiac death. Your stress hormones are decreased. Your immune system's boosted. Uh, the expression 
of inflammatory proteins is decreased. So there's a huge, huge benefit to these types of practices. So she took me through relaxing the body. She took me through a meditative practice that allowed me to attend. She took me through understanding the nature of compassion for self. Because what happens is, if you are not kind to yourself, if you're hypercritical of yourself, then you look at the world through that lens. And you don't appreciate, because you're so focused on your own suffering, you don't appreciate that everyone is suffering. You know, sometimes we have a sense that it's only uh, the poor people who are suffering. But re the reality is whatever level of society you were in, we're all suffering to some degree. And in fact, some of the most successful, wealthiest people I know are extraordinarily unhappy and are suffering deeply. And why is that? In our society, we define success by what metric? We define success by wealth. We define success by power. We define success by having things. And the problem is, in each of us, there's an emptiness. And in fact, for many of you today, you recognize that the only way to fill that sense of emptiness is by being of service to others. It is that which allows you to truly have a meaningful, full, and purposeful <laughs> life. So, after she taught me those techniques, I actually had a profound change. My worldview changed. How I looked at others changed. And what happened was that I realized that when I had these negative opinions of myself, people would see me as that because we are highly intuitive in regard to the emotional states of others. When I changed how I looked at myself and how I looked at the world, I tell people that the world changed for me. It looked at me differently. And it allowed me to believe in my own abilities to have a sense of self, to not be afraid. So after this, I believed that I could go to medical school. I had, when I was in fourth grade, there was a pediatrician who came to my class, and he just, he just was a completely compassionate, caring individual. And I was so impressed by this person uh, after his visit, where he was kind, he answered questions, he was gentle, he was kind, I decided to become a doctor. Well, of course, saying you want to become a doctor and becoming a doctor are very different things. And um, I didn't even understand how to get to college. And I'll tell you two stories here, and then we'll talk about a few other things. So the way I learned that it was time to apply to college was I was sitting next to a girl in my science class, and I looked over, and she was filling out a application for college. I had no clue whatsoever. And I said to her, what are you doing? And she said, I'm applying to college. And I said, oh, really, where are you going? And she said, I'm going to the University of California, Irvine. And then she looked at me, and she said, where are you going? Well, frankly, I had no clue where I was going. But I said to her, I'm going to the University of California, Irvine. <laughs> and she said, really? She said, I have an extra application. And within a week, I had filled that out, turned it in, and applied to one college, and I was accepted to one college. Uh, so then what happened is that uh, 
Because of my personal situation, I had to leave college and go home and deal with an incredible variety of personal issues. And so it came time to apply to medical school. And uh, so we had, at that time, you would go to the pre-med committee office, and then they would give you an appointment to be interviewed by this pre-med committee uh, who would decide whether you're worthy. Well, my grade point average at that time was 2.53. Now, that probably wasn't acceptable. Uh, the average grade point average at that time to get into med school was 3.79. And so I went to get this appointment. The woman at the desk says to me, I'm not giving you an appointment. I said, why? Because it's a waste of everyone's time. Who has the right to tell you they don't even know you? All they're looking at is a file to tell you that you're not worthy. Now, fortunately, I looked at her and I said, well, I appreciate what you're saying. And if you want to call security, that's fine, but I'm not leaving. <laughs> so she did give me an appointment. So I showed up at this meeting. Now imagine what it's like, and I think I was 20 years old. You walk into a room, there are three people. Have you guys seen the picture of Putin at this massive desk? <laughs> right. So, so that's how I was. I'm at the end of this long table, and there are these three people at the end. And the guy in the center, just like Dr. Ham, he took my application and threw it on the thing. <laughs> uh, he took my application and threw it on the table. He said, say what you have to say so we can get this over with. Where's the compassion in this? So I looked at the fellow, and I said to him, who gave you the right to destroy people's dreams? And uh, obviously, this got their attention. And I proceeded to lecture them for about 45 minutes. <laughs> now, interestingly, they, at the end of it, they were all crying. Because you see here, when you objectify somebody, you take away their dignity on some level. You translate them to a number which allows you to not see them as a human being, which then allows you to do actions which you should not be proud of. But if you force them to look at you as a human being, they cannot not do what's right. So at the end of it, they were all crying. The, I ended up getting the highest letter of recommendation. And then as I was leaving, how many of you remember mimeograph sheets of paper? Now, the younger people have no clue what that is, probably. Anyway, she handed me this trifold piece of paper. And what is it? It's a advertisement for a summer enrichment program here at Tulane for pre-med students. And uh, it was for minority students and for socioeconomically disadvantaged students. So the woman, the secretary, gave this to me as I was leaving. And she said, well, I want to tell you that the deadline has passed, but I don't think that will matter for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I ended up talking to uh, Sheree Epps, who was in charge and founded that program. Uh, she did accept me, and uh, when I ended up applying, I still had that 2.53, and I did not have enough credits to graduate, and they accepted me. And fundamentally, that changed the course of my life. And that's why I have so much gratitude for Tulane. Now, um, 
When I was asked to give the Tomlinson lecture to the incoming students, I spent a lot of time in self-reflection. And I wanted to give to these students something that they could carry with them and inspire them and guide them that was easy to remember. I'm sure uh, the medical students here today have to memorize a lot of stuff. Has that changed at all? I guess not. Uh, so what I created was a mnemonic. And it was composed of 10 letters of the alphabet. And frankly, it is what guided me on my own personal journey to be here today. So those 10 letters are C, compassion for self and others. D, recognizing the dignity of every person. E, practicing equanimity, this evenness of temperament. What you are going to find uh, is that you know, when you are, receive accolades, when you've accomplished something, when people congratulate you, it feels great to be in that position. But it's transitory. And one of the greatest causes of suffering is attachment to outcome and craving. If you can s not discount the rewards, but understand what they are, you will suffer much less. Because really, life is the journey. It's not the end. Conversely, when bad things happen to you, many people spiral down and they believe it's going to last forever. But it also is transitory for almost all of us. So if you can live with equanimity, having this even, evenness of temperament, it will carry you through. The other is practicing forgiveness. You know, so many people carry an anger inside them that taints so many interactions. And it's not to forgive, but it's to understand that anger and hostility does only, uh, does nothing towards the other, it only hurts you. G is having gratitude. Now, I always forget one letter, so if I do, maybe you can remember. Uh, G is having gratitude, and there's an immense amount of data that demonstrates that gratitude is so, so important. What happens oftentimes to people who have accomplished a great deal, where are they looking? They're looking up at the person who has more than them. And what does that do? It creates craving and suffering versus looking down and seeing how blessed you are. You know, I was saying earlier that uh, I got a ticket today. Well, you know, there are two different ways you can react to that, right? You could potentially use expletives. Uh, um, and be angry and upset. You know, my viewpoint is, well, that's an interesting distraction. It allows me to meet some interesting people. And if this is the worst thing that happens to me today, I'm very blessed. You see, that's, this is the reality. We choose how we respond to events. It's not the external events that hurt us. We hurt ourselves by how we respond to events. What letter was I? H, humility. Now, I will assure you as a neurosurgeon, this is probably the toughest one for me. <laughs> but carrying yourself with humility, recognizing you are no more important than anyone else, that is huge when you interact with patients. I is for integrity, values that we were talking about earlier that put boundaries on your behavior. J is for justice. As physicians, our responsibility is to care 
for those who are vulnerable. K is kindness, simply doing good acts for no other reason. And of course, all of this is contained by love. In closing, I also want to share with you what I told those medical students at the end of my lecture to them, because I think it's just as important today and reminds us of the privilege and the gift of being a physician. And that is as follows. Your path has been sealed with an oath. It will take you to life's deepest and darkest valleys where you will see how trauma and disease destroy lives. Sadly, you will also see what one human is capable of doing to another. But more sadly, you will see what one human is capable of doing to themselves. But it will also take you to life's highest peaks, where you will see the weak demonstrate strength you, not, you thought not possible, where you will see cures for which you can find no explanation, and where you will see the power of compassion to change lives. And by doing so, see the face of God. So thank you. Oh, we have time. Can I just say one thing? You know, I always prepare slides, and I never get through the damn slides. So, <laughs> but I'll show you a couple real slides real quick, which theoretically were part of this. Of course, first do no harm. Does anybody know who that is? Here is, I think, a very profound statement. I saw the river over which, which each soul must cross to reach the kingdom of heaven. And the name of that river was suffering. I saw the boat which carries souls across the river, and the name of that boat was love. And of course, my friend, uh, and I think this is true today more than ever, the cultivation of compassion is no longer a luxury, but a necessity for our survival. And then, of course, how many of you have heard of Francis Peabody? Because you see, this fundamentally defines who we are as physicians and the importance of caring. The secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. And I will leave that there. And uh, let's just have some questions. Thank you, Dr. Doty. That was beautiful and, and so heartfelt. Um, so we will be having a reception with a book signing, but first, um, we do have some time to take some questions from the audience. So if you have a question, um, Diane will have a microphone, so you can just go ahead and um, come on up one of the aisles and she'll get you the mic. Do you want the second one? I'll ask myself. Come on, medical students, get it together. You, you can't be that high. Right, I mean, right from, there, here, I've got this microphone. I have a question. Um, oh, thank you. 
the, uh, the woman in the magic shop sounded like an awful salesperson, so what was she doing? Or did she actually ever sell you anything? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing, okay. Well, uh, she sold herself, I guess, right? Uh, well, the interesting story about that, actually, is that the owner, her son, was divorced, and he had a son about my age. And the parents got into a fight, and the mother refused to send the son to him because she was angry with him. And that probably in some way correlated with me uh, receiving what she was probably going to give him. That was such a wonderful talk. I'm interested to know what you told the small committee of three folks for 45 minutes. How did you, how did you do that? <laughs> well, you know, when you are intensely angry, <laughs> uh, and it wasn't anger about me personally, it was anger about how blind they were. Uh, in fact, one of the, I think the wonderful things about the School of Medicine uh, is that they don't just look at a grade point average uh, like Stanford does. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> but they look at the whole person. And you know, the interesting thing, uh, which uh, some of you may not know, and this is not to brag in any way, but I ended up becoming a successful entrepreneur and um, uh, it's interesting because even though I learned these lessons, I was a kid and I tried to do the traditional thing of climbing every mountain to prove myself and to deal with my own insecurity. So no matter what I did, you know, I would stand there and look out and there was no happiness, there was no feeling of accomplishment, and it was just a sense that I had to climb another mountain. And the, during the dot-com period, I was involved in a variety of uh, tech-type things and um, ended up in six weeks losing $78 million, which I will assure you does get your attention. And um, that's when I went through another period of reflection. Um, but the gift from that was to understand what I just told you. I had attachment, I had craving, and I was hoping by doing all these things, I see these two ladies jumping about here. They're like grasshoppers going from seat to seat. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I was trying to fill my own void. And when I lost everything, I went through this period of reflection. And what happened was here I had started with nothing, had nominally immense success, but was miserable lost everything, bankrupt. And so my penthouse at the top of a building, my Ferraris, my Par Porsches, the beautiful women who were dating me just because they liked me, they weren't interested in money, of course. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> uh, I realized that I was completely unhappy. I was more unhappy than I'd ever been in my life. So when I lost everything, uh, I changed how I looked at the world because I had previously been doing all of these things, not because I was a bad guy, but because I had this sense of insecurity. At that point, I let go of everything. And in fact, what happened, you know, I mentioned uh, your past is often a reflection of who you are today. That self-reflection allowed me to remove the baggage that I had been carrying and liberated me. And what happened with that liberation? It's that instead of doing it for me, I changed and did all of my actions for others. And that changed everything. It allowed me to create the center at Stanford. It allowed me to meet the Dalai Lama. It has allowed me to meet some of the most uh, famous uh, spiritual and religious leaders in the world. And it's allowed me to do an extraordinary number of things. Now, during that period where I had lost 30 million and was 3 million in the hole, 
who becomes your best friends? There are two. One is your banker, and one is your lawyer. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time, because I had borrowed $15 million. And uh, it turned out that I had actually given away st uh, stocks to charity, but the lawyers, it turned out, had never actually filed the documents. So the lawyer said to me, he said, look, uh, you know, I have to apologize. Um, you're not broke. You still have all of this stock in this company, and you can keep it. Now, what I did, and I consulted all of my friends, and what do you think they said? Keep it. Well, I did just the opposite, and I gave it all away. While I was $3 million in debt, everything. That gift turned out to be $30 million that I gave away. And that allowed me to do many of the things, in fact, endow uh, Dean Ham's chair, help rebuild the library, set up some scholarships and things, as well as at a variety of institutions and set up a number of these charitable things. And now, they actually interviewed my wife when I was doing this. She was not my wife, she was dating me. And so this was with the Wall Street Journal. And they're going, wow, your, your husband, he's so amazing. He give, gave all this money away. And my wife said, well, that's great. I just wish he wasn't so generous. <laughs> but it all worked out uh, fine. Other questions? Hi. I'm a great fan of yours. You know that. A few years ago, we had invited Dr. Doty, courtesy of Jane Eirich, who is your classmate, yes. who is going to be here, but she'll meet you later this evening. Uh, I'm Jay Rao from LSU. I retired several years ago. And I came to your book in India when I was nursing um, jet lag. My father had passed away. And through John kabat zinns the interview you did with him, that's on YouTube. If uh, you haven't seen it, please just punch in those names and that video will come up. That's the best one and a half hours that you would have spent. And those of you who have not already bought that book, run, don't walk, run and get that book. There is way more information, uh, particularly the first passage about a pediatric, uncle, I mean, a brain tumor patient and how he deals with that. Thank you. Well, thank you. And when is your next book coming? You said about uh, uh, intent. Uh, it's supposed to be at the end of the year, but it's probably going to be in the first quarter of next year. Well, thank you for the kind words. It was not a question, but... <laughs> Mine is not a question either. I read your book, and you had come here and signed a few of them. It was the best book I read. And um, being certified in mind-body medicine and calling that my Katrina gift... Jim Gordon trained me along with many people here in certifying, which was actually a more difficult journey than you ever imagine. <laughs> um, I kind of feel that we need to really do more in medical school. And I do an elective, I do interdisciplinary seminars, I still need to do the statistics to publish how the students perceive these two magical hours <laughs> that I can give them. But we need to do more, you know? And I feel that a lot of these things um, are really, <laughs> I call it rich medicine, and I want to say it here, because if you have money, you can learn these things a lot easier than if you're poor. And we're talking about equity and diversity, and your book is so important so that we can change the world and give these kids what that lady gave you, <clears throat> by serendipity, by the way. Indeed. So, so I think that this is a, a wonderful way to dialogue about mind-body medicine, you know, with this wonderful compassion, there's a beautiful training that went to, that's how I ended up reading uh, your book. Uh, but there's so many of them, and we really need to do more for the education of our students. That's how I started with this, and uh, they love it. But we need to make them understand how to relax and take care of themselves. No, that's really critical. Obviously, many of you know that there's a epidemic of stressed uh, stress, anxiety, and depression among physicians especially. Uh, there are not enough programs and courses focusing on self-care. It's interesting, I was talking to the former dean at Stanford, 
about because for years we provided a compassion cultivation training program that medical students, residents, fellows, faculty take. And I said, you know, you guys should have a course on this for the medical students. Because if you look at statistically, the degree of empathy and compassion decreases throughout medical education. It does not increase. And he said, Jim, they just have too many uh, classes already to teach a compassion course. Yet, the fundamental nature of being compassionate, it, especially to yourself, actually improves your outlook and improves everything. And it just shows you the naivete, uh, sadly. Um, that's why uh, I'm certainly a proponent of having courses that actually we know through a whole variety of literature that have a positive uh, effect uh, on uh, individuals. So I think that's uh, really important. Thank you for your non-question. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, it is amazing because uh, that book, you know, I had no desire to write a book at all. And what happened was, um, as a name dropper type of person that I am, I was at uh, Archbishop Tutu's 80th birthday party. And there were only a couple hundred people there. I'm patting myself on the back, of course. Uh, and uh, what's interesting is that uh, the, um, shit, where, where was I going? Oh, he, he had a book launch. And uh, it was a book that his wife and a journalist had done. And at this book launch, there was this guy, and you know, I'm sure all of us go to parties or different events, and there's several hundred people, and you don't remember anybody, right? I mean, this is very common. So I met a lot of people, but this guy struck me because he was six foot seven and very handsome. Uh, and it's okay to say a guy is handsome, okay? Uh, and uh, 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 so that struck me. So, but I didn't know who he was. I couldn't remember anything. So three months later, uh, I'm giving a lecture at Stanford, and I look out, and he's in the audience. And it's, we were in Cape Town. And I was going to talk to him, but he was gone by the time I finished. Three months, or, and I gave another lecture. He's in the audience again. And I'm going, wow, this is crazy. And I'm thinking, well, maybe there are several six foot seven handsome guys floating around. Uh, but then the third thing that happened was that I had just built a new house, which is a very nice house. We had just moved in, and I had a donor who had given me a million dollars to Stanford. He's an engineer type. And he said, Jim, I ha and he did a book on meditation. He said, could we have the book launch party at your house? Well, how could I refuse this guy? But I didn't ask my wife. Now, I will tell any of you, don't do that. Um, so, so what happened is we had 200 people at my house, and this guy shows up. I, I did not make the guest list, and it turns out that he was a literary agent. I did not know this at the time. For uh, Desmond Tutu, um, Mandela, and uh, Richard Branson. But he came up to me, introduced himself, and didn't say any of this. And he said, you know, Jim, I, 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 I think you need to write a book. And I'm like shocked by this guy. And uh, he said, I've been following you for three years, and I've heard so many of your stories. I think it would be very powerful. And so then he said to me, um, you know, the reason I want you to do this is my father's in his 80s. And I've told him some of your stories, and they were very moving to him. And I would like to give this book as a gift to my father. <laughs> So I immediately said yes. I didn't ask him any other questions. I didn't Google him. I knew nothing about him. Uh, and I said yes. And that's how this all started. Now, it turns out his father had been dead for 10 years. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> any other questions? Come on, folks. There's one in the back right there. Yes, sir. Oh. We'll take the uh, gentleman who has uh, more gray hair than you, or less hair, more gray, maybe. Then. Mine is a real question. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, very uh, touching to hear how you underwent the transformation and overcame negative feelings, started feeling compassion for yourself. I think it's a probably a key moment in, uh, uh, for many people, but not everybody can achieve that. What was your secret? How did you uh, overcome 
overcome your uh, negative feelings? Well, um, I think there are a couple aspects. One is that a realization that we are not responsible for who we are. And what I mean by that, you know, a lot of people carry anger and hostility towards people they perceive in a better position. And, and you know, just like a child who's born into a wealthy environment, he didn't choose that either. And so one is understanding um, the negative or the reality that the situation has nothing to do with good or bad and that you're not responsible. Now, obviously, how you react to things, you are responsible for. But uh, as I was saying, uh, some people have said that I would be in the same position today if I had never walked into the magic shop, right? Because uh, some of us have innate abilities uh, that we're born with. And it's possible, I suppose, that that could have been the case. I don't believe that. But I would not, I have no clue what my secret is, right? Uh, and this is why I say somehow looking at my success and then creating the narrative that uh, this is possible for any person, no matter uh, their position in society, is not true whatsoever. And whether uh, it's me or someone else who's accomplished great things and have come from deep poverty, that is a one in a million. What we need to do is to address the situation of poverty in America that has been created because of corporate greed, because there is plenty for everyone. There, is, there should never be a child starving in this country. Every child should be allowed to thrive and reach their greatest potential. And that way, you know, children who do have this potential can reach their potential versus uh, the lives being destroyed because of not having. And there should be no reason why, why there's a homeless person. There should be no reason why people's mental health is not taken care of. There should be no reason why hunger is not addressed. You'll get me on my diatribe here, so I have to temper myself back here. I, uh, well, I think this will be our last question, okay. Jim. Hi, thanks a lot for telling us such an inspiring story. I would like to know, do you practice meditation like in your everyday life? Yes. You do? Do you yeah. recommend any sort of? Well, I'll tell you what my practice is. Uh, I, I'm sure you probably know Thich Nhat Hanh. Do, I, do anybody not know? So Thich Nhat Hanh is a, a fairly prominent, if you're in the compassion space, a fairly prominent practitioner. And he does something called a walking meditation. But the point is, you know, a lot of people think you have to sit on a cushion and cross your legs, and you don't have to do that at all. My own personal practice, uh, and I'll tell one quick story, because I have infinite stories, uh, is, uh, so I mentioned the alphabet of the heart to you. So that is my practice, actually. And what I do is I wake up every day, and I sit by the side of my bed. I close my eyes, and I be Again, slowly breathing in and out, which actually shifts you to your parasympathetic nervous system engagement. I think of the awe and joy of being in this world. And then I go through uh, the 10 letters of the alphabet. And then that sets the tone for my day. That is my practice. When I get stressed, when I get anxious, if something untoward happens, uh, and this is where the story comes in. Um, about two months after I gave that lecture, a woman sent me an email, and she said, I am a person of faith. I um, am the spiritual director at the largest homeless shelter in the United States. I was completely burned out from my job, and um, um, I had resigned. My last day at work, someone shared with me your alphabet of the heart, it, it gave me the inspiration to stay at my job. Like, wow, that's powerful, right? So two months later, she sends me another email. And she says, um, uh, you know, we've started using this practice at the homeless shelter. And I'm like, oh, my God. 
and, um, and subsequently her and I became friends. So then I went down to the homeless shelter and uh, took a tour and actually apparently gave a sermon at the church. <laughs> And then what happened is a few months later, she sends me another email. She goes, this is, you know, I was telling my best friend about this, and she has a daughter named Ginny who's nine, and she makes beads. And on her own, she made a set of ten wooden beads, each one representing a letter. She added a golden bead to represent the golden rule. Uh, she said, would you mind if we sold this to support the homeless shelter? I said, of course. A few months later, she sends me another email. And, you know, this is a stalker now, right? So, so it's um, a video she made, which you can find on YouTube, under Compassion Beat San Antonio, and it shows this little nine-year-old girl's hands on a golden cloth doing this beat thing, and it has music, and she has a, a narration uh, behind it. So I use those beads, actually. And the, I'm continuing to talk, I know, I apologize. Uh, at, the, at the end of it. Uh, um, so she became a friend of mine, and she has two heroes. One is the Dalai Lama, and the other is Desmond Tutu. So, and I was very appreciative of her doing that. So I was hosting the Dalai Lama, and I called her up and I said, listen, why don't you come to meet the Dalai Lama? She says to me, she says, you know, I'd love to, but I have very little means, and, you know, unfortunately I can't. And I said, well, listen, I'm hiring you as a consultant. <laughs> so, I said, bring some beads with you. I flew her out to meet the Dalai Lama. She got to spend time with him. And he, she, he blessed a ton of beads. And so she went back. So the other hero she had is Desmond Tutu. She was born on the same day as Tutu. So I was invited to his 85th birthday. But I was giving a lecture in Oslo. I called her up and I said, listen, you have to do me a huge favor. I said, you have to be my representative at Tutu's birthday. So I paid her way <laughs> to go see Tutu. And the part of that story also is that those actions in many ways changed her life and worldview. And it cost me effectively nothing. And this is the gift that each of us has. Every one of us has within our power to change the life of someone every day. It's not about money, it's not about position. Frankly, sometimes it's just saying hello. So that's a very, very important recognition that you carry with you this power within you, which is a gift you can give to other people for free. So uh, did I have one more? Oh, I have to tell you one more story uh, that involves Dean Ham here, because this is a funny story. So. We meet in San Francisco at this club I belong to to have dinner, okay? And he's running late, which was shocking to me. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's a situation where there are these like tables that are lined up next to each other for two people, right? So I'm on the inside, and there's this empty seat for many minutes. Uh, anyway, he shows up, we start talking, and uh, a woman to my left looks over, and she goes, are you Dr. Doty? And I look at her, she goes, you changed my life! <laughs> and she starts just uncontrollable weeping. <laughs> and she's on her like first date with some guy. <laughs> and she, now she was in her 50s, but she, so she's on this like obviously a first date. And this guy is just like, you know, he can't say a word. And she goes on and she goes, you saved the life of my daughter and me. <laughs> And then poor Dina. It's like just watching this spectacle. Like, believe it or not, this happens not that frequently. So. Anyway, listen, uh, thank you all so much. It's really been a joy, and I hope you've enjoyed it.